When one thinks of what the life of a sniper is like, it's a common misconception, probably as a result of modern day films like American Sniper, that snipers in the field are always out there taking out bad guys and carrying out high risk secret missions. While that's undoubtedly the case as part of their bigger job description, both historically and today the life of a sniper has varied widely due to both the country and conflict. In today's video, we'll look at how the life of a sniper has evolved from its humble beginnings to the professional marksmen they are today. Snipers in American military history first came about during the French and Indian War. However, if you called any of these skilled marksmen and backwoodsmen snipers, they'd probably look at you funny. That's because back then, through the Civil War, snipers were only known as sharpshooters. Sharpshooters during the war were usually men selected for not only their prowess with a rifle, but their ability to track and hunt down the enemy in rugged environments, operate independently for long periods of time, and report back vital information on enemy movements. For that reason, the first American sharpshooters were men who had a wide range of experiences operating in the backwoods. The first organized unit of sharpshooters, Rogers Rangers, organized by Major Robert Rogers, came about during the French and Indian War. Before this time, sharpshooting and tracking were seen more or less as a dirty, non-honorable way of warfare. British and other European commanders looked down upon these savage modes of fighting beneath the classic line-style fighting designed for European battlefields. However, in the backwoods of Pennsylvania, New York, and Maryland, new methods of fighting had to be tried after several disastrous defeats of British regulars at the hands of the French and their Native American allies. Lucky for the British, they found their answer in Major Robert Rogers. As a boy, Rogers had witnessed the aftermath of a French-led Native American raid on a nearby town. After being forced to pull down the inhabitants' entrails and body parts that were strewn about in the trees, he made a promise that he would avenge these people and fight back just like them. After joining the British Army, his ideas were not met with much enthusiasm until 1757, when he was finally authorized to recruit a crack unit of sharpshooters to counterstrike at the enemy since the war was not going well for the British. Rogers Rangers soon grew to seven companies strong and were made up of the most rugged backwoodsmen and marksmen that the new colonies could muster. These men were tasked with bringing the fight back to the enemy any way they could. They were ruthless in their fighting style with one of Rogers' standing orders stating that after engaging the enemy with their rifles, they were to close with their hatchets to finish the job. They were also paid a five-pound sterling bounty, almost a thousand US dollars today, for each French or Indian scalp they brought back from raids. Rogers' rangers were also expected to be on the move and travel lightly, save for a large quantity of powder and ammunition since they were always expected to do a lot of shooting. The men operated mainly as a sort of what's today called quick reaction force. Whenever there was an attack, the rangers were sent out to find, track, and ambush the enemy responsible. When they were not doing that, they would embark on their long-range patrols of scouting enemy positions and ambushing anyone they could find anywhere they found them. Throughout their existence, Rogers' rangers were involved in hundreds of skirmishes and battles throughout North American wilderness. Their prowess and capability cannot be underestimated, as their consistent harassing attacks and intelligence provided British commanders with the ability to maneuver their forces smartly to avoid being cut off and surrounded like they were earlier in the war. At the end of the French and Indian War, the American colonists formed their own crack unit of sharpshooters known as Morgan's Rifles during the American Revolution. This unit, led by Colonel Daniel Morgan, would become the eyes, ears, and surgical precision instrument of Washington's army. Recruited from the same stock of men as before, their role still included plenty of scouting and harassing of Native American settlements in retribution for raids earlier in the war. However, as the war progressed, the men became less and less of a long-range reconnaissance group and more of a tactical element to be employed on the battlefield. One of the first instances of this was their consistent harassing of General Howe's army as it retreated from New Jersey. Along their entire march, Morgan's rifles used their superior Kentucky rifles to snipe at the Redcoats at distances of up to 500 yards, an unheard of distance and tactic for the time. As the men fought with the British more often toward the end of the war in 1781, the men formed part of a corps infantry battalion that under the leadership of Morgan himself was crucial in defeating the British in the Battle of Cowpens. The battle forced Cornwallis to abandon his invasion of the South and seek refuge at Yorktown for rest and refitting. After that, well, you all know the story. After the American Revolution, it seems that the practice of employing sharpshooters fell largely out of favor until the advent of the American Civil War. It was here that sharpshooters would begin to become assets whereby their tactical decisions would have long-term operational and strategic impacts on the war itself. 
Shortly after the war broke out, sharpshooters began to take well-aimed shots at high-ranking officers and generals on both sides. The first general officer casualties to snipers happened during the first few months of the war, and the practice of sharpshooters aiming to take out generals would become standard practice throughout the war. However, the life of a sniper in the Civil War and who could become a sniper was radically different than before. Prior to this conflict, sharpshooters would have acquired the skills necessary to become a sniper years before joining the army. However, now, with the meat grinder of the war in full swing and no end in sight, the Union needed to pump out several regiments of sharpshooters for frontline service and did not have the luxury of waiting. Initial qualifications to become a sniper were, of course, the ability to be a good shot. Their own commanding officer also had to be recommended as only mature, physically fit, and intelligent men could become a sharpshooter. Once passing a shooting test, those that made it were given a lot of on-the-job training by veterans who had already experienced the horrors of modern combat. One of the most significant changes that came about was how snipers would operate on the battlefield. Instead of scouting and harassing the enemy far behind their lines, the main job now was to support the infantry and exploit weak points in enemy positions. A perfect example of their life during this time comes during the Siege of Vicksburg, Mississippi. During the siege, the Confederates were holed up in a fortress of a city that had repelled with heavy casualties several Union assaults to take it. As a result, hundreds of sharpshooters were let loose about their deadly work to degrade Southern morale and take out any Confederate that dared move around. From the memoirs of a Confederate captain who survived the battle, the effects of the sharpshooters were astounding. They would shoot at anything and everything that moved. No matter the time of day or where they were, the men were always in a constant state of fear. Even looking over the parapets of the trenches for even a moment was a probable death sentence. The sniper shot so much that it literally was impossible to move during the day. Only at night could the men leave the comfort of their trenches, and even then it was still risky. While his men took serious casualties during several Union assaults, it was the consistent daily casualties from sniper fire that dwindled down his numbers and sapped the will to fight from the survivors. Such a strategic implementation of employing snipers have never been seen before on the American continent and would not be seen as a terror weapon again until World War II. Though World War I saw extensive use of snipers, especially with the advent of new technology such as telescopic sights, the use of spotters and decoys beyond these tools in their life did not differ much from that of an ordinary soldier due to the essentially static nature of the conflict. It was during World War II, however, that the life of a sniper changed dramatically due to the largest and most intense theater of war in human history, the Eastern Front. Snipers on the Eastern Front faced a genuinely unique experience. Due to the sheer scale of the German invasion and the need for practical tools to stem the enemy tide while the Red Army recuperated from its losses, snipers here saw arguably the most widespread use and thus were the most successful snipers in the history of warfare. A perfect example of how many of the highest scoring Soviet snipers got their feet wet in the field was none other than Vasily Zaitsev. Beginning the war as a clerk in the accounting department of the Navy in its Far Eastern fleet, Vasily yearned for a chance to fight at the front. After his request to go into combat was approved, he was attached to the 284th Rifle Division and sent to the Battle of Stalingrad. It was here in the autumn and winter of 1942 that Vasily would learn how to become a sniper and change the course of history for the Soviets and future snipers altogether. In the rubble of the ruined city, he first began his forays on his own time after the unit had stopped fighting for the day. He would set out with his standard issue Mosin Nagant rifle and attack any targets of opportunity he could find. Officers, artillery observers, machine gunners, radio operators, and of course other snipers were the primary targets he would hunt. Unlike the famous Finnish sniper Simo Haya, Vasily wanted to effect a real change on the battlefield with just his rifle. As a result, though he would take shots at average German troops, he would always try to take out high-value targets first so that the infantry would have an easier time on the ground. His tactics paid off, and within a matter of months he rose from relative obscurity to a national hero. Soviet leadership, sensing his value as a trainer for future generations of snipers, removed him from the front lines and had him teaching new crops of snipers to carry the fight to the enemy. After Vasily's successes became widely known, Soviet doctrine also began to change so that by the end of the war the average infantry platoon was assigned at least two snipers for long-range fire support. However, life as a sniper in World War II varied greatly depending on the front and the combatant. While the Allies, such as the Soviet Union, the US, and Great Britain all began embedding snipers as a direct infantry support weapon, countries like Nazi Germany began to use them as a terror tactic once more. 
While professional German snipers continued to operate through the end of the war in the same way as their enemy counterparts, larger and larger numbers of semi-professional and inexperienced snipers were employed to cause havoc beyond the front lines. It was quite common, especially on the Western Front, that when German forces retreated, they would leave dozens or sometimes hundreds of sacrificial snipers behind to cause as much damage as possible. These snipers oftentimes wreaked havoc on advancing Allied troops who thought they were safe from German gunfire only to be cut down miles behind the front from concealed snipers in trees, bushes, buildings, and chimneys. Though often successful in striking their enemy, these snipers were less trained and less experienced than their counterparts who had been fighting for years already. Oftentimes, these were one-way suicide missions with massive retaliation in the form of artillery, plane, and tank attacks used to flush out these last-ditch defenders. After the end of World War II, snipers still retained this infantry support role. During the Korean War, they proved vital at striking at the unseen enemy in the mountains and valleys of the Korean Peninsula. In Vietnam, the American military began to employ them once again into what's morphed into the modern-day role as a scout sniper. The role of a scout sniper is twofold. Their primary job is to be inserted behind enemy lines to operate independently and report on enemy locations. Such actions were as vital then as today in fighting a guerrilla war where large bodies of troops can move unseen and are hence avoided by the enemy. Snipers operating in small teams can easily blend in with the environment and report back vital intelligence that can either be used to rain down indirect fire on an unsuspecting enemy or help plan coordinated search and destroy missions. Snipers today are fortunate to have years of modern developments in ballistics, scopes, and rifles at their fingertips. Because of this, snipers in an infantry support role can now consistently hit targets over a mile and even a mile and a half away. Because of this, snipers can provide valuable top cover to infantry operations where they can take out or at least suppress enemy movements to cover advancing troops.